So we have finally made it to the last lab. So this is a fairly big lab. We're going to do um, the urinary and reproductive systems in this lab. So first we're going to start with the urinary system. So just our general organs, there aren't that many in the urinary tract. So we start out in the kidney and that's where the urine is going to be produced and then essentially we just have to get the urine out of the body so it goes through the ureters and then into the bladder and then out the urethra so if we take a look at this we can just kind of see how all those organs fit into place fairly straightforward so we're going to start out with the kidneys so these guys sit right here okay and we'll talk a lot more about the kidneys. And then the urine is essentially gonna pass out of those kidneys and into the ureter. So one big thing is a lot of people get the ureter confused with the urethra. So this is a female uh, model here. So the urethra is kind of coming um, inferiorly, whereas in the male, it's going to project more anteriorly. So that's a little bit different. Um, so we'll talk about the differences between the male and female uh, systems as well later. Uh, but essentially that ureter comes into the bladder and then out the urethra. So don't get ureter and urethra confused, okay? I know they're very similar in terminology. So if we take a look at the kidney, so we're going to look at the internal anatomy of the kidney first, and we notice that we see similar terms, right? Our cortex and medulla. So we've seen that before in some other organs. Uh, specifically, we talked about the adrenal glands. So we have a cortex is usually on the outside of the organ, and the medulla is usually on the inside of the organ, okay? And then within that renal medulla, we've got what's called these renal pyramids. And so they are what are making up the renal medulla and we'll, it'll make more sense when we look at a picture. And then the renal papilla kind of come off the base of the pyramids and then they turn into um, uh, the collecting ducts and that's where the urine is gonna come out of um, the kidney. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. It'll make more sense when we look at a picture. So let's take a look at those structures on our gross kidney model. So we've taken a sagittal section through the kidney and we can appreciate some of these structures. So the cortex is the outer region. So about from there to there. So the cortex is where all the urine is being produced in these glomeruli, so we'll talk about that. And then the medulla is pretty much the rest of the inside structure. So pretty much all this structure here. But if you notice, there's these distinct kind of upside down triangular regions. And those are the renal pyramids, which are making up that medulla, okay? And essentially at the base of all these renal pyramids or kind of where it comes to a point here, you see there's a lot of lines. Okay, so these little lines here are all the renal papillae. So the papillae are essentially the collecting ducts draining all that newly produced urine. And it's going to go into these tube works called calyxes. So we'll talk about these guys, these major and minor calyxes. And then they're going to all collect into the renal pelvis and then go out that ureter. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit more about that. So the other thing we have to talk about are the blood vessels of the kidneys. So um, they, it has its own artery coming in, right, the renal artery, and it has its own uh, vein going out. So the renal artery and the renal vein. And then we have to distribute that blood all throughout um, the cortex of the kidney is where we're most in, um, needed in the blood. So essentially, we're going to have a bunch of arteries coming off of that renal artery, and we're going to continue to branch until we get out to the cortex. So first, we have our renal artery coming in, and I'm going to find a different color, maybe yellow, or let's do purple. So we have our renal artery coming in, and then our first branch is going to be a segmental artery. 
So we have multiple segmental arteries coming off of that renal artery going to the different areas of the kidney. And then that segmental artery is going to branch into an interlobar artery. Okay, so here's our interlobar artery. We've already done the segmental artery. And then, so, and why it's interlobar is we kind of call um, the renal pyramids lobes. So they are also called lobes. So they're going to go inter or between lobes. And then it's going to make a turn. So you notice it turns over the top of that pyramid. And once it turns, it's called the arcuate artery. Okay, so it makes an arc. I like to think of that. Okay, so it arches over that pyramid. Okay, and then it's going to shoot off all these branches into the cortex. Okay, so all these branches are coming off that arcuate artery into the cortex. So we call those cortical radiate arteries. Okay, so the cortical radiate arteries are also called interlobular arteries. So don't get that confused with interlobar, but interlobular arteries are the same as the cortical radiate arteries. I just like cortical radiate artery better because it tells you it's out in the cortex, right? Cortical and they radiate off that arcuate artery. So I like that better, but you could do either one. So essentially, those are, um, and then the blood goes into the capillary networks that we'll talk about in a little bit, um, and we filter and produce our urine and all of that, and then it's going to go out, the blood is going to continue back out into the venous system. So then you have the cortical radiate vein, or veins, right? So then we're going to go the opposite direction, so let's use blue. Right, so now we're going to leave and we're going to go back through the arcuate vein, through the interlobar vein, into a segmental vein, and then out that renal vein. Okay, sorry, it's in the blue down here. So we come in through the arterial system. We're going to go through all the capillary beds in the cortex, which we'll talk about, and then we're going to exit out through the venous system. Okay, and we have a pretty good um, kind of a flow chart of the blood flow through the kidney, and I want you to be able to um, identify that. So that could be part of the short answer question. It could be a, you know, if you're a red blood cell and you start in the renal artery, how do you work your way through uh, the blood vessels of the kidney? Okay. So here is that uh, flow chart. So what we just said, we're going to start in that renal artery. We're going to go through all those branches until we get to that cortical radiate artery. Now we haven't talked about um, the capillary beds yet. So we have these two different capillary beds that we're going to talk about. So don't worry too much about that yet. But essentially we're going to go into the glomerulus and that's where all the filtration happens or we're going to go into the peritubular vasorecta capillary beds here, okay? So, um, and then you're going to go out the venous system and eventually out that renal vein, okay? So this middle section will make a little more sense in a second. Essentially, we got to go through the glomerulus to get filtered, okay? And that's where the urine is produced. And then you're going to go through a capillary bed one of these two capillary beds and then now your deoxygenated blood so then you're going to go out through the venous system okay so now if we look at the um, kind of microscopic anatomy of the kidney and we're going to look at how we actually produce urine and the nephron is the functional unit of the kidney. So it is what is going to be producing that urine, okay? So we have something called a renal corpuscle, and I know that's a weird word, and essentially it's made up of a glomerulus, which is part of the um, vasculature, and then you have a glomerular capsule around that, which is also called the Bowman's capsule, 
And part of this whole renal corpuscle is this uh, juxtaglomerular apparatus. So we'll talk a little bit more about that, but it's how uh, your kidney is able to sense blood pressure in your system. So um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that and don't worry too much yet. So once you um, once the blood goes through the glomerulus, we're going to filter out pretty much everything except the blood vessels. So everything that gets filtered out is going to go through the tube work of the nephron. So the tubing is going to consist of these different um, you know, twists and turns and loops. And so we have some convoluted tubules, we have a loop and some more convoluted tubules. So we'll take a look at that in the journey of um, the urine, okay? So let's look at the nephron itself. So we have blown up a portion of the kidney, okay? So if we look here, this portion here is the cortex. Okay, so we have our, our arcuate artery and vein coming here, which delineates the difference between the cortex and the medulla. So then this whole section down here is the medulla. So cortex on the outside, medulla on the inside. So if we follow the blood flow coming up through that arcuate artery, okay, then we're going to throw off those cortical radiate arteries, okay? So here's those cortical radiate arteries. They look kind of like a little tree. And then off of those, you see these little tan circular structures. Those are the renal corpuscles, okay? So you notice that the blood is going to go through that renal corpuscle. So if we open up the renal corpuscle, we notice, so here's one that's kind of opened up, we see a little red globular structure and that's the glomerulus, okay? So essentially coming out of that and then out the tan portion around that glomerulus is that glomerular capsule, okay? So then here we see this yellow tube work that comes out, okay? That is the proximal convoluted tubule. So once we've filtered out of the blood, we're going to go through this uh, tube work or through the rest of the nephron. And essentially, it goes through that first proximal convoluted tubule. Then it's going to go through the loop of Henle. Don't worry about descending or ascending, even though it's kind of straightforward. And then once you get all the way up here, you're in the distal convoluted tubule. And then all of these are going to collect up into this collecting duct. So it's going to collect all the urine from all those different nephrons. So this whole structure here that we just talked through from that renal corpuscle through all these loops, that is one nephron. Okay, maybe I should have circled it in a different color. Let's do purple. So just this structure here that we just talked about, okay, that's one nephron, okay? So you see you've got all these multiple nephrons coming off of these arcuate, um, or the, sorry, these radiate, cortical radiate arteries. So you have multiple nephrons, and then they're all going to dump into one of these collecting ducts. And again, then you're gonna have multiple collecting ducts all coming down. Okay, and they're all going to collect at the base of that um, renal pyramid, which is part of the medulla, and those are those renal papillae, which is all these collecting ducts coming down. Okay. So now that we know kind of what a nephron is, so essentially what happens is, is the urine is a filtrate, right? So we filter out kind of everything but the blood vessels in those renal corpuscles, okay? And what happens is what we're going to produce as urine goes through the nephron, right? And produces and what's going to become urine comes out that collecting duct. So we resorb whatever we want, all the water and electrolytes and everything, and get rid of all the waste. So let's go back a little bit to the vasculature. 
So what happens to all the stuff that doesn't go through the nephron? So essentially the blood, so we come back to our arcuate artery and veins. So the arcuate artery is bringing in the blood Okay, and it's going to go up through that cortical radiate artery. It's going to go out through the glomerulus. Okay, so the little branch off the cortical radiate artery is called an afferent arteriole. Okay, so again, afferent anything is always going into something, adding to something. Okay, and then the filtrate is going to go through the nephron, but what happens is, is the blood that doesn't get filtered, so all those blood cells and everything are going to stay in the vessel, and it's going to go out the efferent arteriole. So afferent arteriole coming in, efferent arteriole coming out, and then it's going to go through a capillary bed. Okay, so if we look over here, this is our representation on this model of our peritubular capillaries. Okay, so essentially the capillaries are going to wrap themselves around all these tubules. Remember we have all those uh, proximal distal convoluted tubules? Well, the capillary bed is going to wrap itself around that. So that's what that's pointing to here. But this is a good representation over here of what the bed, the capillary bed actually looks like. So that's where all the gas exchange, nutrient exchange is going to be happening in that capillary bed. Okay, and then once it is now deoxygenated blood, it's going to go back through that cortical radiate vein, through the arcuate vein, and then out that interlobar vein, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, now there is a different capillary bed, and so we haven't talked about um, the different types of nephrons, but essentially there's a nephron that sits a little bit uh, lower in the cortex and even um, really close to the medulla, so we call them juxtamedullary nephrons, so they kind of sit, you know, really low down, down here, okay? And so what happens is their loop of Henle goes way down into the um, into the medulla. So this would be like a better representation here of maybe a juxtamedullary nephron. So see how much further down that loop of Henle goes. And then we have a capillary bed that goes around and wraps itself around that loop of Henle, and that's called the vasa recta. And essentially these guys are what help concentrate the urine. So you really filter all this blood and you're only going to produce a small amount of urine because you want to really take back all that fluid. You don't really want to excrete all that fluid. So you're really just trying to excrete the waste. So the vasa recta, all these loops are what are helping concentrate the urine. And you'll talk a lot more about that in physiology. So now let's look at kind of a close-up picture of one of those renal corpuscles. So you have a glomerulus in the center, okay? So that's the vasculature. That's where everything's being filtered. And then you have a glomerular capsule, okay, which is the outside, okay? So here's your glomerular capsule surrounding that glomerulus. So what makes up the glomerulus is your a um, sorry, your afferent arteriole coming in, bringing the blood in, and then it's going to be filtered in that glomerulus. So any of the filtrate is going to go out and through the tubule, through the nephron, and anything like your blood cells and everything are going to stay in the capillaries, and they're going to go out the efferent arterioles, okay? And you have two layers of that glomerular capsule. Kind of think of it like a serous membrane, okay? Remember we have a parietal membrane and a visceral membrane? Well, this is the same thing. You have a parietal epithelium and a visceral epithelium in the glomerular capsule, okay? And part of that visceral epithelium is what is causing the filtrate, okay? Creating the filtrate from um, that glomerulus, from the blood, okay?
And we haven't talked too much about that juxta glomerular apparatus, but essentially it sits right in this, uh, right near this afferent arterial coming in. So it can uh, register the blood pressure of that afferent arterial. And essentially it signals the body, hey, if you have low blood pressure, we need to increase our water intake. Um, resorb more water from the kidney so that we increase that blood pressure or increase um, that blood volume. So essentially that's what's happening uh, in the kidneys. So this is just a different model. I know it's kind of colorful, kind of confusing, but if we find our arcuate artery and vein right here, that's going to delineate the cortex up here and the medulla down here. Okay, so always find that arcuate artery and vein because that's going to delineate your cortex and medulla. Okay, and then if we find then those um, uh, cortical radiate arteries and veins, they're coming up, up off of here. Okay, see they call them interlobular. Okay, so again, you might see interlobular, which is the same as cortical radiate arteries and veins. And then they're going to throw off those afferent arterioles out to your glomerulus. So on here, your glomerulus or your renal corpuscle is going to be green. And then essentially you can kind of follow the blood work um, as well. So if you follow that afferent in and efferent out, here is your peritubular capillary bed. Okay. And then if you are filtrate and you want to go through the um, tubular work, you're going to come out and go through um, all this convoluted tubule, and I think this is a lot harder to tell what is proximal convoluted tubule and what is distal, but essentially the orange one is labeled as proximal convoluted tubule. Then you're going to go through that loop of Henle, and you're going to come up through the gray distal convoluted tubule and out the collecting duct. So the yellow, bright yellow, is going to be the collecting duct. So it's just a different model to kind of show you what's happening. I think there's pros and cons to both models. So now what happens to the urine after we've produced it in the nephron, right? So we have um, the filtrate coming out of the glomerulus, going through the nephron, through all the loops, and now we've gone out the collecting duct, and, we've, and then we're going to have multiple collecting ducts um, into um, a papillary duct. So that's that renal papillae at the base of that pyramid. And then at the base of each pyramid, essentially think of these calyxes, and calyx is named like for a goblet, like a, um, like a cup. So think of these like cups. So there's a minor cup at the base of each pyramid, which is going to receive all of those papillary ducts, which were all those collecting ducts. And then the minor calyxes converge into a major calyx. So we have a couple calyxes coming together. Essentially, you get into these bigger and bigger uh, structures, pooling of urine, essentially, until finally you all pool into the renal pelvis. So the renal pelvis is the largest area or pooling of urine. And then essentially it, it funnels it out the ureter. So then the ureter is the exit of the urine out of the kidney and down to the bladder. So if we just kind of go through those um, calyxes and how we get the urine out, we have gone through our nephron. So here's the kind of the uh, far away version of what we looked at close up. So you see all those little renal corpuscles, those little dots, and then your collecting duct here that's going to make up all those uh, renal papillae that are all coming out this way. You see each of these minor calyxes that's going to collect from each of these um, renal pyramids. 
And then you have multiple calyxes to group into this major calyx. And then the renal pelvis pools all those major calyxes together. And then it funnels, it's like one big funneling system to funnel that urine out the ureter. So then if we follow that ureter, we're going to travel to the bladder. And the bladder, essentially, the whole job of the bladder is to just to store urine until you're ready to void that urine. So essentially, the bladder is just a big muscle, and they call it the detrusor muscle. And just like we talked about the stomach, it's going to have rugae or folds to allow for distension. So any uh, organ that allows for um, expansion or distension is usually gonna have rugae. And then once you have decided you're gonna void your bladder, then that urine is gonna go through the urethra and outside the body. So here's our structure of the bladder. So here's our bladder and we have a, um, a sagittal section or actually a coronal section um, through the bladder and we have our ureters coming in okay and they actually take a dive behind the bladder and they're actually going to enter the bladder right here so kind of lower and at an oblique angle so it helps to keep the bladder or sorry the urine from coming back up uh, the ureters so these are the openings to the ureters right here, okay? And then you notice there's folds all through the bladder and that's the rugae. And then you have a big muscle, the detrusor muscle, which helps to squeeze out the urine, out the urethra. So then the urethra is going to be at the base here. And just depending on uh, male or female, there's different urethral anatomy. So here's a full model of the pelvis, and this is a male um, model. So first you've got your kidneys up here, and you can follow the ureter all the way down, okay? And it's gonna make a curve over the pelvis, and then it's gonna come at an oblique angle down at the bladder. So here's your bladder down here. And since this is a male, you notice the urethra is coming off that anterior side of the bladder versus um, a female would come out um, more uh, distal or inferiorly. So what is, we're gonna look at these um, models again when we go through the reproductive system, but just to kind of take a look at it, you see the ureter coming in at an angle over here. And so here's the other ureter coming in right here, because this is the bladder. So here's the urinary bladder. And then that urethra is gonna come off the front and it's gonna continue since it's a male as the spongy urethra through the penis. And then for the female system, so again, we're going to look through these models um, in the reproductive system as well, but here's our ureter coming down, and it's going to go behind. Here is the uterus, so you can't get confused with the uterus. Um, here is our bladder here, so the uterus always sits on top of the bladder, which makes sense if you think about pregnant women and they have to pee all the time because that baby's sitting right on top of the bladder. And then the urethra comes out more at an inferior angle um, uh, than the male. All right, so we finished up the urinary system. So now we're gonna get into the reproductive system. So first we're gonna talk about the male reproductive organs first. So let's start with the scrotum, which is outside the body, and it contains the testes, which are the primary sex organ in the male, because that is where your sperm is produced. That's where the testosterone, the hormone, is produced as well by the cells in the testes. So once the sperm is produced, then it's going to make its way through the epididymis. So the epididymis part of the epididymis is inside the scrotum as well. 
And then um, essentially the epididymis is swim school for the sperm. And then the sperm is gonna make its way into the vas deferens or ductus deferens, which is one of multiple structures that make up the spermatic cord. So the spermatic cord also contains um, the cremaster muscle, uh, the nerves and the vasculature as well coming down to the testes or to the scrotum, okay? And then once that the sperm make its way through the vas deferens, which has a very long travel um, up and around the bladder, and then it's going to join uh, with the um, some of these accessory glands, and we'll talk about those accessory glands, which are producing the majority of the fluid in the semen, which is going to help that sperm uh, for the journey. And so that's gonna join in at the ejaculatory duct where all the fluid is going to join from the glands. And then it's gonna make its way out the urethra and out the penis. So if we look at some of these structures, here's our same model that we just looked at. So if we recognize our ureter coming down, our bladder, okay? And then we see some of these other structures as well. So Remember we said the ductus deferens has a long way up from the um, scrotum. So it's going to work its way all the way up and around the backside of the bladder where it joins the seminal vesicle and the prostate, which are um, some of these accessory glands we'll talk about. And that's where it's gonna gain most of the fluid of the semen. And then it's gonna work its way through that urethra and out the penis. So here's our spermatic cord as well. So the spermatic cord contains multiple different things. So not just that ductus deferens, but the testicular artery um, and the uh, venous structures as well. So multiple structures in that um, spermatic cord. And then the scrotum houses both the testis itself and the epididymis. So it's the protective structure um, of the, the primary sex organ. So what are those accessory sex glands? These guys are what are going to secrete the majority of the semen. So why is it important? The big thing is that it contains sugar and proteins. And essentially it's going to maintain um, and keep the sperm healthy and alive, hopefully, until it makes its way um, through the female reproductive system. So what are these um, different sex glands? So the seminal vesicles, so there's two of them, one on either side of the bladder. And then just under the bladder is the prostate gland. And then we have two bulbal urethro glands on either side um, as well of the urethra, okay? So what do these guys look like? Some of the things we can see, um, it looks like we can. So if we took off um, some of those structures in the model, we're able to open it up. So essentially the vas deferens would have made its way kind of around the backside of the bladder here and joined up with the ejaculatory duct. So here's our seminal vesicle, and essentially it sits right here on either side, one on either side of the bladder, and it's going to um, excrete some fluid into the ejaculatory duct. And then the prostate gland is right here, and it surrounds the urethra. So the urethra is coming out this way, and so it surrounds the urethra and adds in some more fluid and then the bulbal urethro gland, so there's one on either side, sits right here and it's very small. And essentially it's going to um, put fluid through the urethra prior to the rest of the semen. So essentially it's going to clear out the urethra of any sort of urine because urine would kill the sperm. So this is the pre-ejaculate that comes through to clear out any sort of urine so that the semen has a clear path and it won't uh, kill the sperm on the way out. And then uh, we follow the urethra out of the penis.
So now if we talk about some of the specific structures of the penis, um, we can break this up into a couple different structures. So the glands penis is really just the head of the penis. And then the prepuce is the covering over the penis, but it's only uh, found in non-circumcised peni. So that's the structure that is being removed in the circumcised penis. And then within the penis itself, so we have the spongy urethra going through the penis, and then around the spongy urethra, we have the corpus spongiosum. So there are these erectile tissues that fill with blood during an erection, and the corpus spongiosum is the smaller of the two, and it surrounds that spongy urethra, which is why we call that the spongy urethra, because of that spongy ocean. And then above the urethra, the majority of the penis is made up of the corpus cavernosum. And essentially, these are two large erectile tissue structures, um, kind of above and on either side of the urethra. And that is what makes up the majority of the tissue tissue and fills with blood uh, during an erection. So if we look at what that looks like on the model, so we have some of our familiar structures here. And if we just look at the penis, we have the urethra going through, okay, coming out that glands penis, which is just the head. And then around that is the corpus spongiosum, around that spongy urethra. And then above that, you notice this structure here, and that's the majority of the tissue of the penis, and that's the corpus cavernosum, okay? So now we're gonna finish up with the female reproductive system and the female reproductive organs. So the ovaries are the primary sex organ in the female. And the ovaries are what are going to pr produce the ovum or the, the eggs. And essentially they're gonna work their way through the uterine tubes into the uterus. And then if, um, if there is conceptus or a pregnancy, then that will stay in the uterus. Otherwise, um, monthly cycles and it will be expelled out the vagina. And uh, the vulva are the um, external structures of the rep uh, female reproductive system. And we'll go through that when we look at the picture. So here's our female uh, pelvis model. So again, if you find um, some of those urinary structures, we have our ureter coming down here into that bladder. And we have our urethra coming out, okay? So if we look at some of those external structures first, because we can orient ourselves with the urethra, and just anterior to the urethra is the glans clitoris. So that's going to be the same um, like homologous structure to the glans penis in the male, okay, the erectile tissue. And then we have two folds. Um, on either side of the urethra and of the opening of the vulva. We have the labia minora, which is the smaller of the folds, and then the labia um, majora. Okay, and if we find the pubic bone as well, which is kind of right above um, the glans clitoris, then you have the mons pubis. And that's just kind of some fatty tissue over that, that pubic bone. Now, if we go back into the internal structures, um, we find our ovary. So we have one ovary on either side. And so that's the yellow tissue right here, okay? A lot of people think this is the ovary uh, right here, but that is the fimbria. So the fimbria is part of the uterine tube. So it's gonna pick up that ovulated egg and then it's going to take it into the uterine tube or oviduct. And then that's gonna come into the uterus. So here's our uterus here, okay? And then the opening to the uterus is the cervix. Okay, so this is the path the baby is gonna be developed in the uterus, and then it has to pass through the cervix, through the vagina and out the vulva, okay?
So if we look at some of the structures of the uterus, we have um, some layers. So layers of the uterus, just like any other organ. We have kind of an outside, middle, and inside layer. And then we have some ligaments as well to keep the uterus and the ovaries in place. So if we talk about the layers of the uterus, we have a perimetrium on the outside. So peri is always on the outside. Myometrium is the big muscle. So the uterus is a large muscle. It has to be able to push that baby out. And then the endometrium is the lining inside the uterus that is shed every month um, during menstruation. And it's also the lining that's going to allow for the development of a fetus as well during implantation and pregnancy. And then the cervix is the opening to the uterus. So um, that's the delineation between the uterus and the vagina. So then those ligaments that are going to hold things in place, uh, these will make a little more sense when we look at the picture as well, is we have a broad ligament that's kind of on either side of the uterus and holds the ovaries and the uterus all together to the body wall. And then the ovarian ligament specifically just holds the ovaries in place. And then the round ligament comes off the anterior side of the uterus to the anterior side of the body wall. Because if you notice, the uterus kind of tips forward, tips anteriorly, and that is tied down by that round ligament. So if we take a look at that, so here's find our ovary with that fimbria attached. The fimbria is actually not attached, but essentially it um, it's like a finger-like projection that uh, works its way over the ovary to look for that um, ovulated egg. And essentially it picks it up and um, takes it through that oviduct or uterine tube um, all the way to the uterus. Okay. But if you notice, there's a little ligament down there, and that's the ovarian ligament. So it holds it in place right next to the uterus because essentially the ovary is not attached to the uterus in any way because, like I said, that fimbriae and oviduct is not attached to the ovary at all. And then we have a broad ligament that essentially is kind of part of the uh, peritoneum and kind of attaches um, to the ovary and to the uterus itself. And then we have a round ligament coming off that anterior side of the uterus attaching to the anterior body wall to help kind of hold it in place. Because if you notice, it's kind of tipped anteriorly and sits on top of that um, bladder. So if we look at the layers of the uterus, that outer layer is the perimetrium. The majority of it is the myometrium, which is the big muscular layer. And then the endometrium is the inside lining. So this just goes through um, the structures we've already talked about. Um, just a different picture um, with a couple different labels. Don't worry about the uterosacral ligament, okay? Don't worry about that. And then last but not least, um, I don't want you to, to know too many fetal structures. I just want you to know about the placenta. So essentially let's orient ourselves. So here is the vagina down at the bottom. And here is the cervix, which is the opening into the uterus. So the baby's head sits right on top of the cervix. And essentially on either side, you have your ovary with those fimbria and the oviduct. Okay. And then this whole structure is the uterus. So the baby pretty much takes up the entire uterus. And there's the development of the placenta on the wall of the uterus. So the placenta is made up of both maternal and fetal tissue. So essentially it's the, it's the fetal lungs. Remember we talked about the placenta um, bringing in the oxygen and nutrients to the baby as it develops. And then the baby itself sits inside the amnion or the amniotic sac.
So that's the end of your last lab. So we don't have a quiz on this lab. We're just going to have our lab exam next week. And again, I'll post um, some uh, review questions for the short answer questions. And I can also post a list of um, the study guide structures for you guys um, by the end of the week uh, for you guys for your exam next week. All right, talk to you later.